Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, the rapidly growing use of nanoparticles in our food. In general, nanoparticles is, uh, you know, particles dimensions are less than about 100 nanometers. A whole series of different particles in foods that are either naturally present or that are, you know, engineered to put into foods. How these microscopic particles are used, how they interact with our bodies, and how they could play an important role in feeding people in low and middle income countries. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, March 16th, 2017. I'm Amy Montemiro. And I'm Noah Levitt. In this week's episode, we're talking about nanoparticles, tiny microscopic additives that are used in hundreds of foods. These particles are often used to make foods more visually appealing. And while they're commonly used, researchers say there's still much to learn about how nanoparticles may affect human health, both positively and negatively. The Harvard Chan School is the home of a research center studying the safety of nanotechnology. And that center recently hosted David Julian McClements, a professor at the University of Massachusetts, for a lecture on food-grade nanoparticles. We took that opportunity to sit down with McClements and discuss what we know about nanoparticles, their safety, and future uses. And we started the conversation by having McClements explain his background and how he started researching this area. Take a listen. So I started um, as a food scientist. So I trained as a food scientist in England. And I did a you know, bachelor's degree and PhD in food science. And during that, I was looking at nanoparticles, but using ultrasonic waves to mm -hmm. characterize nanoparticles. So we're passing sound waves through foods and looking at how they were scattered by foods. And we could get information about the size and concentration and physical state of the nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to America and did uh, some postdoc there and worked on um, different types of colloidal systems, which were kind of nanoparticle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the last few years, my research group is doing a lot of work on trying to look at the beneficial aspects of nanotechnology in food. So how we can use nanotechnology to develop more effective antimicrobial delivery systems or more effective delivery systems for vitamins or um, nutraceuticals that, uh, um, as components from foods that promote health. So it's a lot like the sort of pharmaceutical approach, mm. but applying it to food systems. And as part of that work, we, you know, we're looking at all the benefits of nanoparticles, but we also wanted to see like, what the potential adverse effects of having nanoparticles in foods as well. And so for people who might not be familiar, I guess broadly, what are nanoparticles? And then kind of specifically related to food, what are some of their uses when it comes to food? Yeah, so in general, nanoparticle is, is, is uh, you know, particles dimensions are less than about 100 nanometers. And there's a whole series of different particles in foods that are either naturally present or that are, you know, engineered to put into foods. So some of the naturally present ones are some like casein micelles, which are part of milk. So the, um, you know, evolution has designed these particles to sort of uh, feed infants and, you know, help them grow quickly. So you have got an easily digestible protein and phosphate and calcium in these little nanoparticles that the, you know, the, the infant can digest very rapidly um, and, and grow quickly. Um, so that's an example of a natural nanoparticle, but you can also engineer nanoparticles. So we, we do a lot of work with homogenization, make these really tiny lipid droplets. And we've shown that you can improve the stability of foods and um, you can improve the bioavailability of nutrients in foods by encapsulating them in these tiny little nanoparticles. So in a sense, when it comes to food, like it, are you kind of building off what is already going on naturally with food? Like you mentioned casein with milk. So kind of food has kind of developed over years to have these nanoparticles built into them. Yeah, I think that's like one approach. You take like a biomimetic approach. You see like what's worked in nature. So like, you know, evolution's designed this over millions of years. And then can you make something that's going to be as effective, but actually engineering it, you know, economically uh, in, in a factory? So a lot of our work's on that sort of organic nanoparticles. And the other areas are inorganic nanoparticles, so things like titanium dioxide. Mm -hmm. They're used um, as a lighting agent, so in lots of sweets and candies. Mm -hmm. It makes them look very, you know, gives it a really nice white, um, a, a bright appearance. Mm -hmm. Or you can get a silicon dioxide, which is used in powders to help them flow. Mm -hmm. So we're eating nanoparticles all the time in our foods. So and can you so could you expand on that like the idea of these for so at least with, with regard to these kind of like organic or natural nanoparticles what what are some other examples that um, maybe we're frequently seeing in food but maybe don't realize it uh, I mean I think if you drink any beverages like vitamin water you know that's full of lipid nanoparticles that have got vitamins encapsulated in them so there's billions of nanoparticles in there that we consume all the time and they have to make them very small to keep them stable in the product. If they were bigger, they would just cream to the top and the product wouldn't look the same. You know, um, uh, you know, you know, milk, if you homogenize milk, you start off with quite big droplets, like fat droplets in the milk, but once you homogenize it, you get a population of very small particles. So everyone who's drinking 
regular milk is it's full of nanoparticles already so just because in the nano size range doesn't make them toxic. I think when people maybe hear this, I'll think, oh no, nanoparticles, this sounds bad. But it's it's not, I mean, I know part of your work is kind of teasing out benefits and potential concerns, but I mean, a lot of these do have benefits. Like this isn't, just because a nanoparticle is in your food isn't a, isn't a cause for concern, right? Yeah, d definitely not, yeah. And right. I think a lot of the organic nanoparticles we work with, they would just get digested in the body anyway. Mm. Um, so by the time they get to the small intestine, they'd be the same as if you had a larger particle. So they, they, there is no major concern with them. So and, and when it comes to benefits, is like is the chief benefit of a nanoparticle largely like making it easier to ingest nutrients? So I guess kind of what are some of the other benefits that come from using these? Yeah, some of the benefits would be like if you, one of them is it increases the bioavailability of nutrients. Mm -hmm. Another one is you're trying to encapsulate um, oil soluble components and put them into aqueous products, so like a, um, a vitamin water or something. And um, you have to make the particles very small if you want to make it transparent. So if you want to make something clear, the particles have to be less than 50 nanometers, otherwise it looks cloudy or milky. So, you know, in that case, you use nanotechnology to get a certain appearance. And you can also use it to change the texture of foods. So you can, you know, change the viscosity or the gel strength of the food by using nanoparticles in there. So there's a whole range of different apl potential applications in the food industry for them. And so you, you, you mentioned a second ago that, I mean, the way that a lot of these work, that when it gets into your body and it's digested, it's almost, mm -hmm. you, you're, I mean, essentially your body won't know the difference. So, so, do, so what do we know kind of about the mechanism of how, like, a nanoparticle goes from our food, digest it into our body, and then our body uses it. So what do we know about that mechanism? Yeah, so that's a, my whole research area is on that area at the moment. It's like trying to look what's happening in the mouth, the stomach, and the small intestine, and how that changes the, the structure and the characteristics of the particles, and how they get broken down in the body, and then how the nutrients and, get, and the nanoparticles get absorbed by the body. So it's a big research area. There's quite a few people working in that area at the moment. Is the goal there to, I guess, more efficiently engineer nanoparticles so that if we know more, more about how our body is responding to them, we can make them more efficient in, in products? Yes, yeah, so we're doing uh, some research where we're looking at sort of, so we have two approaches. One is called like a delivery system where we use nanotechnology to encapsulate a component like a beta carotene or a vitamin E or vitamin D or something. And then the other approach is to leave all these beneficial nutrients in the food themselves. So we leave like um, carotenoids in carrots you eat the carrots, but we design a food that you eat with the carrot, which is based on nanotechnology, and that breaks down in the body, and it helps you absorb all the nutrients from the carrot. So from a carrot, if you eat a raw carrot, you probably absorb 5% carotenoids. But if you eat it with this specially designed nano emulsion that we make, you can absorb 40 50%. So you like get 10 times more of this beneficial um, nutrient. And that could be important for things like eye health. There's this comp carotenoid called lutein, which is really important for eye health. It stops mm -hmm. macular degeneration. So if we can increase the amount that gets absorbed, especially by older people, we may be able to prevent uh, you know, like a, a, a bad disease from happening. And I guess what are some of the, the future applications? Because I, I guess the, one of the things that popped in my head is maybe creating more nutrient-dense foods, for example, because I think of this in the context of climate change and concerns over crops and crop growth. So is that maybe a potential application down the line? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things we've been thinking of is like, you know, in the developing world, you know, mm -hmm. that you, you can put nutrients in foods, but if they don't get actually absorbed by the person who's consuming them, then you're wasting that nutrient. So this is a way of increasing the amount of nutrients, but actually increasing the percentage that gets absorbed by the body. So you make them actually more potentially health you know, have more health benefits. So you can basically just create like a, an incredibly like nutrient dense food. Yeah, so nutrient, so it, you can have a nutrient dense food, but the nutrients don't get absorbed. It doesn't, you know, it, it's no use. So you have to have a nutrient dense and it gets absorbed by the body. So what we're trying to do is design foods that can do both of those. You increase the amount of nutrients present, make them stable in the food, but it, they also get more of them absorbed by the body. And so on the flip side, what would some of the concerns be that, that you're seeing or that people, you know, working in this area are seeing? Yeah, I mean, one of the areas is increasing bioavailability. You know, so we said, like, usually that's beneficial. But the studies that show, like, some, like, vitamin E, if you give people very high concentrations of vitamin E, certain segments of the population, um, that can be detrimental. For example, smokers, mm -hmm. you increase your cancer in smokers if they get high vitamin E levels. So if we've developed a nanotechnology that, really boosts the amount of vitamin E that gets absorbed in that specific population, it could have some detrim detrimental effects. Mm -hmm. um, the other possibility would be, you know, we design these what we'll call excipient nanomulsions to increase the bioavailability of the good, the good nutrients in foods. Mm -hmm. But if those foods, uh, fruits and vegetables are treated with uh, pesticides, you could also increase the amount of pesticides get, get absorbed as well. So there's like, 
there's benefits, but there's some potential risks as well that need to be taken into account. Um, and so you mentioned pesticides, and obviously there's a lot of, when it comes to food, I think one of, one of the kind of recurring heart topics is GMOs and genetic modification. Are there, is there any, are there any concerns about interplay between nanoparticles and genetically modified food? Is that a concern at all, or is there any link there? Not really. I mean, I think there's a, you've seen a similar trend, especially in Europe, where there's a real anti-GMO movement, but there's mm -hmm. also a really anti-nano movement as well in, in Europe, and I think that's made a lot of food companies very reluctant to sort of adopt nanotechnology or at least admit that they're adopting nanotechnology, you know, in, the, in their food products. Why has there been that kind of like anti-nano movement? I think people are just scared of new technology, you know, and I think maybe, I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, I think um, there is some potential for risk, um, but I think at the moment there's not enough evidence to really say like which type of nanoparticles could be um, cause adverse health effects and which ones don't have a, a, an effect. There's uh, lots and lots of research out there, but there's a lot of conflicting evidence and people are not using realistic systems to test them, They're using levels that are much higher than you would ever consume and showing that you have toxic effects. But in reality, nobody would ever consume that, um, that amount. And so when we talked to kind of going back to the beginning, you talked about, you know, some maybe some of the more inor inorganic nanoparticles that might be used like food coloring or candies. Um, are there kind of separate concerns around those? Yeah, and I think um, probably inorganic nanoparticles have got much more potential for toxic effects than, than the organic nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. And particularly, you know, thing, things like you know, nitrous oxi nitric oxide ones and um, silver ones, mm -hmm. uh, they're more likely because they can cause, they're, they're more chemically reactive. So if they, got, if they did get into your cells, they've got more likely to cause damage when they get in there. And so if so, like kind of jumping off of that, like if you are a consumer, are there things that you would want to look for in products that maybe you would want to avoid or just kind of, you know, looking in the, looking in the ingredient label? Um, I mean, again, I think at the levels that most nanoparticles in there, there's probably not a major concern. I mean, I think I wouldn't eat products with like silver nanoparticles in there. I mean, I think they're very, uh, I mean, people do it. They eat this uh, colloidal silver. And I think there's a famous guy who's the Smurf man who's turned blue from taking a... <laughs> overdoses of uh, <laughs> colloidal silver. Um, but, you know, that could, you know, silver is a very effective antimicrobial, and it, if it gets through your body and goes into your colon, it could really change your um, microbiota, which could have some, you know, health effects. We don't know whether they're good or bad. So, that, you know, there are some concerns. How, how does kind of what we're learning about, like, the microbiota f fit into all this? Like, is, is, as we learn more about the microbes in our body, is that kind of help us understand better how nanoparticles are kind of interacting with us. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you've got as people are trying to establish what a healthy microbiome looks like. And I think that still hasn't been completely established yet. But um, if you eat nanoparticles, some nanoparticles are antimicrobial, so they may selectively knock out one segment of the microbiome and, you know, stimulate the growth of another. So you're going to change the microbiome and whether that's good or bad, we don't know. And what I guess kind of like looking forward, what are maybe one or just some of the kind of biggest unanswered questions that, that you still have or that researchers in the field still have? I think, I mean, I think that one of them is r really what potentially toxic effects can nanoparticles have? I think there's a lot of potential benefits and, and it's always going to be a risk benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the problem is, is just developing um, good standardized methods to characterize nanoparticles and their fate in the gastrointestinal tract and how things like the diet affects that. Because my, I'm, a, from a, I'm a food scientist and we do a lot of work on looking at how different food components affect the fate of nanoparticles in the gastrointestinal tract. And a lot of people don't do that. But when you eat these things, if you eat chewing gum, you know, it's in a certain matrix. If you eat silica dioxide, it's in a powder. And the amount of fat and protein and carbohydrate there is going to affect how it behaves in the gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to develop really good standardized methods so we can get strong evidence to make good policy on. A base that's really science-based. That was David Julian McClemens talking about nanoparticles and nanotechnology. And he mentioned at the end that there is research underway to examine the effects of nanoparticles on our bodies. And the way they conduct that research is pretty fascinating. Basically, scientists will construct a simulated gastrointestinal tract. So they'll recreate the conditions in a person's mouth, stomach, intestines, and colon. And then they can run nanoparticles through that simulated system. They combine that research with animal studies where they're actually able to use live imaging to see how nanoparticles travel through mice and rats and to see where those particles end up in the body after they've been ingested. If you want to read more about McClement's work or to watch his full presentation, just visit our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. 
And coming up in next week's episode, we'll be focusing on opioid abuse in America. We'll talk to the author of a new study which is shedding light on how doctors' varied prescribing habits may be fueling the country's opioid epidemic. That's all for this week's episode. I'm Amy Monomiro. And I'm Noah Lovett. A reminder that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, or listen anytime at soundcloud.com slash Harvard Public Health. 